Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this, the first meeting of the Greater Manchester Combined Authority uh, in 2021. Um, I will start with apologies received from Sir Richard Lees, and we have Councillor Nigel Murphy attending for Richard this morning, also from Councillor David Molyneux, uh, Councillor Keith Cunliffe attending for, uh, for David. Uh, also apologies received from uh, Jeff Little and Donna Ball uh, attending in Jeff's place. So moving on to item two, chairs, announcements and urgent business. Uh, just one uh, this morning and it's a, a sad duty, but in many ways a, um, uh, a pleasant one to, to perform, which is to record the fact that this is the last uh, Greater Manchester Combined Authority meeting uh, for somebody uh, who has uh, given 40 years of public service uh, to uh, Greater Manchester. I am, of course, talking about the Chief Executive of Salford Council, uh, Jim Taylor, a dear uh, friend to us all uh, and a much trusted uh, and much loved uh, colleague. In my notes, it says that Jim has served in seven of the 10 boroughs of Greater Manchester and in one borough on two separate occasions. I think that probably makes him uh, the Sam Allardyce of, of local government uh, in, in Greater Manchester. Um, I don't think he's ever got anybody relegated, so that also uh, backs up the, um, the analogy. Actually, more than that, he's, he's led uh, all of the um, organisations and the, the, the boroughs that he served onto, onto greater things and onto, onto real, uh, real uh, success, as everybody, I think, on this call today can, can testify. Before being in local government, Jim, was uh, a distinguished uh, head teacher in a secondary school uh, in Manchester. Uh, then, of course, has uh, served in uh, children's uh, services um, and at, at different points um, has been um, director of children's services uh, in Tameside and uh, acting uh, chief executive in acting as chief executive in three boroughs, Rochdale, Trafford, and of course, uh, currently, uh, currently Salford and. Uh, under Jim's leadership, um, Salford, of course, has uh, experienced huge levels of growth and investment and change, uh, change uh, for the better. I remember being down at a very wet um, uh, RHS Bridgewater with Jim uh, as it was under construction uh, a couple of uh, a couple of years ago, and that's a project that I think uh, is very much. Um, uh, a testament to the the work that Jim has done to put Salford up there, uh, bringing national uh, national attention. Salford City Council has been highly commended uh, in the uh, the annual awards in 2018 and 2020. Uh, I could go on and on actually, just looking at my notes. There is so much uh, so much to say. This is a, an incredible record of achievement, and probably what I will do is is leave it for others to um, to also add. Uh, their own their own uh, colour to the to the tribute. So all I can say, Jim, from my point of view, through working with you, uh, you are uh, an exemplary uh, public servant, somebody who clearly cares and is compassionate about um, the communities and the people uh, you, you're there to to serve. And we've all enjoyed uh, working with you. We've all learnt a, a great deal uh, from you. Uh, and I think uh, the way you you go about things in many ways. Uh, set such a good standard for everybody else to follow. But I, I will leave it uh, there and I will hand over to the City Mayor of uh, Salford, Paul Dennett. Paul. Thank you very much, um, Mayor Burnham. I'm getting used to um, hearing all of this in, in a number of meetings I've been attending over the last couple of weeks where people have paid tribute to Jim Taylor and it's it's fantastic to hear, really. Um, I've always known that Jim kind of epitomises what I would refer to as the quintessential public servant, you know, quietly and persistently behind the scenes, making progress, making things happen, and also, you know, demonstrating his style of leadership and management, which is all about collectivism and team, bringing people together, working through, you know, difficulties, issues, and moving forwards and you know it's been great to work with Jim now nearly over seven years at the City Council here in Salford and as you've rightly highlighted Jim has 40 years public service you know a fantastic achievement really and even on his last day of public service which is in many respects is today he's here at the combined authority 
making things happen, making sure papers are tabled and people are properly briefed. And that is just Jim through and through, to be honest with you. And it's been great to hear all the tributes over the last few weeks. It's quite clear to me that Jim is much loved by many people within the public sector, including local government and our own combined authority. Jim will certainly be deeply missed here in the city of Salford across, you know, the local council, the CCG, the hospital, the third sector and all of our partners in the city will really miss him. Certainly big shoes to fill in terms of the next chief exec in Tom Stannard. But I just want to say thank you, Jim, and I want to wish you all the very best for the future. And don't be a stranger. Keep in touch. And thanks for everything you've helped me with in Salford and helped us with here in Greater Manchester. It's deeply, deeply appreciated. Thanks, Mayor Burnham. Thanks very much indeed, Mayor Dennett. And may I invite the leader of Trafford Council to add a tribute, uh, Councillor Andrew Weston. Andrew. Thanks, Andy. I will be fairly brief because obviously yourself and Paul have um, you know, covered Jim's phenomenal record, but just on a personal note, I wanted to thank Jim for what he did for us in Trafford in 2018 and 2019. Uh, many of you know Jim came to us at, at quite a difficult and unsettled time for the council. He didn't need to do that, but he did so willingly and he had a fantastic impact in just six months. Um, we embarked on a number of serious change programmes within the local authority um, internally around culture where Jim had a real impact in terms of changing the working environment for people and becoming a, a popular and accessible chief executive for us um, in those months that he was with us but he also um, was fondly remembered for initiating the chief executive's blog um, which I know was very well read by all of our um, members of staff who used to follow what was going on with Jim's uh, large family actually who he now gets to spend um, more time with and that's something that, that Sarah has continued as well and I know is, is uh, still incredibly well received but, but as I say Jim um, helped us out when um, many would have failed to have stepped up to that challenge and nobody could be more deserving of the tributes today. It is uh, on behalf of all Trafford staff and residents that, that I say thank you to Jim and although I am um, slightly irritated to see him retire still so young and, and quite jealous as I think I'll be working far beyond the age at which Jim goes I do um, want to wish him all the very best for the future in every regard except for one um, which is clearly of the footballing nature um, and we, we seem to have uh, a more appropriate team from a Manchester perspective atop the Premier League table for the moment. But that aside, I do wish him all the best of luck for, for the future and massive thank you on behalf of the people of Trafford for, for the support and the service that he gave to, to me personally and to the borough more widely. Thanks, Andy. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Andrew. Uh, great words and, and richly uh, deserved. So he's not expecting this, but I'm going to put him on the spot and uh, uh, give the old speech call. But uh, Jim, would you mind just uh, uh, giving us a, a few words of, of response uh, to, to what you've heard this morning and anything you'd just like to say to the members of the combined authority? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, it would be rude of me to um, speak before a leader of a council. But I do think uh, Councillor Warrington's had a hand up. She wants to make a oh. comment. So perhaps if I take over the chair for a minute, Mayor Burnham, and just hand over to Councillor Warrington. Always the gentleman, Jim. Yeah, absolutely. Please, uh, please do. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Jim. I really appreciate that. And uh, it really epitomises, you know, the way that you've always worked. You've always been very alert and uh, very courteous. And I just wanted to say briefly, I mean, I, I joined uh, Tameside Council, what, 20 years ago now, virtually, I think. And um, at the time, you, you were a, a very, very senior officer. Uh, you certainly uh, had a handle on the education and particularly my recollections is that you know you led for Tameside uh, on children's services and you did a remarkable job in a very very difficult area uh, and I know that we all still experience um, difficulties in children's uh, but but the work that you did for us you know sort of paved the way for some 
um, areas of work that uh, saw us in good stead at the time and, and certainly still do. And as has already been said, you know, you, you've always been um, a, a really, really superb officer wherever you've been and whatever you've been uh, tasked to do. And it doesn't surprise me that you're having such, um, you know, wonderful tributes paid to you today. Uh, but on behalf of Tameside for the work that you did for us those years ago, thank you. And we all wish you all the best uh, in your retirement, whatever you choose to do. I know you won't be, you know, sat with your slippers on all day. That won't happen. Uh, you, you'll have some plans, I've no doubt. Um, but all the best from us at Tameside and thank you for everything. Thank you. Well, well said, Brenda. So uh, now, uh, Jim. <laughs> OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Can I, can I just thank uh, Paul and Andrew and Brenda and yourself, Andy, for those kind words? I'm not too sure um, about the analogy with Sam Allardyce, um, but I can hopefully say there haven't been any relegations, so I, I'm quite happy to, to, to reference that one. Um, I'm very conscious that uh, Councillor Brett's on the line and uh, I wouldn't want to prolong something, so I did have a 40 minute speech prepared, but in deference to Councillor Brett, I'm not going to deliver that. All I will say is that it's just been an absolute pleasure over the years to be involved in such a, an exciting, innovative and a vibrant conurbation and I've thoroughly enjoyed most of it. So certainly uh, it's been it's been uh, an absolute joy to work with such fantastic combined authority officers, uh, very, very supportive politicians uh, and fantastic peers. So thanks very much, Mayor Burnham, for um, spending the time to at the beginning of the meeting just to say thank you. Much appreciated. Oh, yeah. Uh, you're absolutely welcome, Jim. Um, and as you can tell uh, today, you're leaving with a, a great deal of affection uh, from us all, uh, enormous amount of respect uh, for what you've <clears throat> achieved and with a legacy that we will all uh, seek to, to live up to. So thank you very much from us all, Jim. Thank you. Andy, can I just... Uh, I would have joined in, but I'm having IT problems yet again this morning. Um, so I would have joined in, but uh, I, don't, I certainly don't want to prolong this meeting. And you promised me last night it's going to be an hour. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. OK, colleagues, let's um, let's <clears throat> let's move on um, to uh, the rest of the business. Um, Item three, declarations of interest, you know uh, what to do. Item four, minutes of the GMCA meeting, 18th of December. Are they approved? Thank you. Item five, minutes of the GMCA overview and scrutiny committees uh, in January. So we've two, corporate issues and reform on the 19th, housing planning and environment on the 14th, to note colleagues. Item six, minutes of the uh, GM waste uh, committee, 22nd of January, also to note. Item um, uh, seven, uh, minutes of the GMCA audit committee, 22nd of January to note. Uh, item eight, minutes of the GM transport committee, 11th of December to note. Item nine, minutes of the local enterprise partnership, 19th of January also to note. Uh, item 10, GMCA appointments. Uh, this is to note the appointment of councillor Dylan Butt from Trafford to replace Councillor Brian Shaw on the GM Waste and Recycling uh, Committee, just to note uh, colleagues. Moving on to item 11, um, the first substantive item. This is the mayoral general uh, budget and preset uh, proposals for 2021-22. Uh, and I will invite our treasurer, Steve uh, Wilson, to, um, to comment uh, in a moment, but Members of the, um, of the combined authority will know that I took a decision in uh, December, uh, which I announced, to freeze uh, the, um, the mayoral uh, general precept uh, for the coming financial year. Obviously, that includes um, substantially um, the funding for the fire service, uh, but also um, for the other uh, mayoral uh, priorities. So this would mean um, that um, the, the, the precept, of course, stays the same for the coming financial year. It's um, for the majority of people in Greater Manchester, um, uh, a £70 precept, uh, which splits 
uh, 51 uh, uh, pence to the fire uh, pounds, sorry, to the fire service, 19 uh, to the other mayoral priorities. Um, for a band D property, 90 pounds, uh, 66 to the fire service, 24 to other mayoral uh, priorities. Um, so the decision obviously is informed by the context that we are in. Uh, and of course, this is an extremely difficult uh, time for, for everybody. And I'm very uh, conscious of that, as are the 10 leaders and, and, and all of the um, councillors in, in Greater Manchester. We want to minimise uh, our call on the public as much as we possibly can. Also recognising that council tax is a, a regressive tax, uh, hitting the poorest hardest. But also I've had a, an eye to what is going on in our 10 districts and the very difficult situation that our leaders uh, and cabinets are facing uh, with regard to a significant black hole in council finances uh, looming next year caused by the pandemic and unfortunately not filled uh, by the government. So uh, obviously the position varies across the 10 districts, but uh, there is pressure in all and significant pressure in some. And it would not have felt right uh, for me to add to that pressure if we could possibly avoid it. So the proposal we're putting forward to you today holds uh, the precept, freezes it, but at the same time does allow us to uh, deliver on things that we've all agreed are priorities for us. For instance, um, we will be able to hold Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service at 50 pumps um, and uh, at its current uh, workforce. And this, I hope, gives a strong foundation to our new Chief Fire, Fire Officer, Dave Russell, to continue to build on the progress, the excellent start that he's made and the progress uh, that we've seen uh, since, um, since the, um, the Kurz Lake review. And I think we can all see and feel that now. And we're grateful to all members of Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service, particularly our frontline uh, firefighters who were praised only last week by HMIC for the way that they have responded uh, to the pandemic. So um, we're grateful uh, to all of them. Um, moving on to other priorities, of course, um, tackling rough sleeping remains a, a top personal priority for me. And this uh, preset proposal will enable us to continue to support uh, our flagship A Bed Every Night uh, uh, scheme, which I'm so grateful to all of our leaders uh, for, for backing as well. It will be supporting uh, again over 520 people uh, this evening uh, across Greater Manchester, uh, people who would otherwise uh, be in a, a very desperate situation at this particular particular time. And we're grateful for all of our uh, volunteers and, and community organisations who continue to support uh, a bed every night alongside council and housing staff. And finally, of course, it supports our our pass for young people. Um, free travel and opportunities, particularly critical now, uh, given all of the um, the disruption uh, to young uh, people's uh, young people's lives. Just to say something about what, what is coming, there is an element within this proposal for uh, the support of bus reform in Greater Manchester, whichever way we decide to go, and we will come on to those matters later in our agenda uh, today. So that's the proposal. But Steve, uh, may I hand over to you just to add any anything extra from the detail in the paper which you believe leaders need to see? Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a couple of things to add around the process, just so that uh, leaders are aware where this fits in with the, the wider budget setting uh, arrangements. So um, the uh, the full suite of budgets for the combined authority will come back to the special uh, CA meeting on the 12th of February, which will include, in addition to the mayoral budget, the waste budget, the transport budget and the CA budget, as well as capital proposals for the year ahead. Um, the uh, the key issues within the paper, I think, have been well covered, um, so I won't add anything to that. The, the final thing just to say from a, a Section 73 officer point of view, uh, which is the combined authority equivalent of the, the Section 151 officer in, in local authorities, can just confirm that I'm, I'm comfortable with the, the proposals set out here and, and in particular with the proposals uh, and the position of, of reserves for the mayoral and fire and rescue service budgets going into 21-22. Um, happy to take any questions on the detail, but don't propose to add anything more than that. Thank you, uh, Steve. Um, so colleagues, as Steve just said, this isn't today to, to finalise and agree the proposal, it's simply to consider it, uh, to comment on it if you wish, 
Um, and obviously to note um, the points that, uh, that Steve and I have drawn your attention to and are in the paper. Would anybody like to come in on this item? If not, colleagues, can I uh, ask that the recommendations as set out uh, one to seven are duly uh, noted and considered. So uh, thank you very much, colleagues, for your support with that. If we can move on to item 12, uh, monthly economic recovery update, I'm going to hand over to um, our uh, lead on the economy and business for Greater Manchester Councillor Elise Wilson. But just to, to say, of course, the, the ongoing challenge of the pandemic uh, is affecting our, our businesses and our economy, but we're beginning to see the first signs of Brexit disrupting uh, the activities of some of our uh, of some of our, our businesses. So uh, this month's uh, update very much uh, we'll, we'll have to pick up on both of those fronts. But uh, uh, Elise, over over to you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Andy. And uh, yeah, so I present the report to the combined authority today. Um, it's the economic dashboard that we see every month and the details are, are obviously there for you to read. Um, since the dashboard was published with the meeting papers, the Office of National Statistics have released new labour market data for the UK. Um, you'll see um, in the report uh, that um, 141,250 Greater Manchester residents uh, claimed unemployment related benefits in November, um, and which is a slight increase on the previous month. Um, however, in the data that the Office of National Statistics uh, produced, um, it did out, out show a disproportionate increase in economic inactivity um, for people in the North West. Um, and inactivity in the Northwest has increased much more than in other regions of the UK. Um, and I think uh, that's that's significant and something for us to be um, uh, focused on going forward. Um, businesses are still relying on government backed loans as well as grants to see them through this latest lockdown. Um, I think it's £780 million in coronavirus business interruption loans and £1.95 billion in bounce back loans have been offered to businesses in Greater Manchester as at the 11th of January. Um, but the most recent uh, Growth Hub survey um, from the 18th of December to the 18th of January, so that a crucial moment of uh, where we um, the withdrawal agreement came in to effect shows an 18% increase in the number of businesses reporting a negative impact from EU exit uh, from the previous report. Um, and so what we're really seeing here is the twin challenges and issues of um, responding to the current COVID crisis and also um, the adjustment um, with the new relationship with the EU. Um, there has been um, a lot of feedback from um, business representative organisations, including the Chamber of Commerce, Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce, about the dramatic increase in the number of um, inquiries around um, uh, import and export um, issues since the new um, withdrawal agreement came into effect. Um, and that's uh, a lot about the complexity um, and the uh, which is is really significant and um, trying to work out um, how to fill the paperwork in and, and how to um, uh, go through the processes um, and, and, and get used to the new bureaucracy that is now in place on that. Um, I think it is um, really significant also to know the increased costs um, that has been a real strong um, reporting back about how much costs have increased for the um, transport of goods um, and moving those around, um, which well, we, we are where we are and how how long some some of this um, has been uh, potentially short term teething problems um, whereby processes um, we become more familiar with processes and processes um, become more um, streamlined. Um, however, I think there is consensus that the additional costs um, in um, imports and exports that have, a, that, have, that have been associated with that are going to be permanent. Um, I think what, we'll, what we've seen and what I've focused on so far is, is goods. Um, we know that there's holdups with goods. We know that the bureaucracy around goods and the, and the additional costs have mentioned. However, um, 
we the people people haven't moved around as much and that's partly to do with obviously lockdown and uh, the current uh, covid crisis um and so we seem I, I feel like there's been little uh, talk or maybe progress i feel about what what we're going to do around the agreements on on services and the grace periods that are currently in place so i'm thinking things like professional qualifications um and ensuring that as um, lockdown eases as the economy opens and people are more free to move around um, what impacts are going to happen because um, of this new relationship with the EU and um, how are we at what you know what thinking is being put in place already um, because of, I think we risk um, sleepwalking into bigger problems as people start to move around and the issues around services um, financial sector and the professional sector around things like just professional qualifications, for example, which is just one small part of a raft of, of issues that still need to be ironed out in that service sector. Um, but with that, um, uh, Andy, I think I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. But happy to take questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Elise. Um, uh, yes, a, a challenging uh, outlook, but you set it out very, very clearly for us and, and very helpfully. I have um, Councillor Eamon O'Brien who would like to come in on this item. So, uh, Eamon, over to you. Thanks, Chair. Um, more of a comment than a question for Elise, because um, we've been getting feedback from our businesses in Berry through our Berry Business Leadership Group and we initially approached the group saying, well, as a council, we've not had that many uh, queries. You know, we've not had that many concerns raised with us. So, you know, had it been going, had it been going well um, for, for businesses? Uh, and what we actually found actually under the surface of that was that many businesses uh, were dealing with issues, um, but were dealing with them perhaps more directly with their uh, business partners, the sort of hauliers, the, the, the people who support them in their exports. Um, and actually, on the back of that conversation, we were finding uh, exactly what Councillor Wilson has outlined, that there were serious and significant concerns. Um, one about the bureaucracy, but also about the increased costs of moving goods. And I think the bigger concern underneath that was, inevitably, there will be some teething problems additional costs, permanent additional costs, were being built into the system of exports. And all that does is it makes our products in Britain less competitive, makes our businesses in Bury and Greater Manchester uh, less stable. And all at a time when we know we're facing econo economic challenges from lots of different perspectives. So whilst I'm not going to be uh, someone who predicts uh, complete doom and gloom, I think we do have to face a reality uh, that our businesses who export to countries in the EU are finding it difficult. Uh, I'll give one, one brief example, which was that a business who was trying to process uh, a sale of only seven pounds to the Republic of Ireland had to spend several, of our, several hours doing paperwork. Now, that might be more easily classified as a teething problem, but I think it reflects the fact that that would have been done in probably seconds, minutes uh, prior to uh, the, the new rules uh, following Brexit. So clearly there are concerns. Um, there are concerns about uh, clawing back VAT um, from countries, uh, some predicting it could take years before VAT was returned to businesses, which massively impacts things like cash flow. So. We do need to keep looking at this. We do need to be very serious about the consequences of it alongside all of the other challenges that Councillor Wilson quite rightly highlighted. So I just wanted to bring that to uh, the GMTA's attention um, because I suspect that that's not a particular issue in Bury. I, I suspect it's probably replicated across uh, not only Greater Manchester, but the country. Uh, and, I th and, and it's probably something we should be monitoring as we usually do on a monthly basis. Um, to give that support but also then to stand up and say if it's not working somebody needs to fix it and that will be the government's responsibility so i uh, just wanted to add that in chair thank you 
Thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, Eamon. I think you uh, strike exactly the right balance there. It's not about finding problems, is it, or overstating problems. It's simply about uh, identifying them as quickly as we can. And some of them may be teething problems, but some may be more substantial. I, I was prompted by what you said just to express my concern about the failure to um, secure visa free um, access to Europe for uh, for the music industry, um, given how significant that industry is to Greater Manchester, one of our best exports. Um, it feels to me unfortunate to say the least that there is now a barrier in, in front of our uh, our musicians and I would imagine that the kind of call for that service is much more British musicians going into Europe as opposed to European musicians coming here given the strength of our music industry so it's those kind of issues that we can need to continue to raise in this period to make sure that we get the best arrangements we can for uh, for Greater Manchester uh, businesses uh, and and performers. So thank you very much, uh, Eamon. I'd now like to come to uh, Councillor Sean Fielding, leader of Oldham. Sean. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I was struck by some of the, the final words that Councillor O'Brien said, um, where he, he said that it's for the government to find solutions to some of these problems. And um, I, I wish I could be as optimistic that they would uh, as uh, the way Eamon's delivery suggested that he is. Uh, because of course we saw uh, Brandon Lewis on Question Time talking up the benefits to Northern Ireland of being able to trade with both the single market and the UK, which of course is a relationship that we surrendered with Brexit. And if the government is the ple are the people to find the solutions, then it appears that their solutions appear to be uh, to advise companies to set up a base in Europe. Um, and so my question really to Elise is, have we got any evidence that there are companies in Greater Manchester that are being advised to set up a base in Europe and are doing so because we know that that will cost jobs here because for every person they employ in the Netherlands or whichever country they might choose to set up another base in it's somebody that's probably going to be made redundant here so it might be too early to say uh, but it will be interesting to know if we've had any feedback at this early point that companies based in Greater Manchester are setting up some uh, setting up shopping in Europe so that they can continue to get the access without experiencing whether these are teething problems or whether these are long term problems that are impacting on their businesses. Many well, thanks, Sean. Um, it certainly is a really important question. Uh, so I'll hand that over to Elise and anything Elise wants to say in, in concluding this item, Elise. Yeah, thank you. The point around separating those issues between COVID and and and, and the new the new trading arrangements is really really difficult. Uh, and Councillor O'Brien is 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 right to say that at the minute businesses are muddling through either through their own supply chains and networks, um, or things aren't necessarily being reported back or fed back. Um, through as a direct result of this new working relationship with the EU and so we were still trying to um, work through what that means um, and it's quite early days for us to be able to really understand what that situation is. Um, I think it's it's it is it is a challenge and it is going to, uh, and I'm serious when I say that my concern is that we're really at the minute only just talking about goods um, and the transport and the export and the import of, and, the, and the movement of goods. And, and, and whilst I think um, at the minute we could potentially see far more significant issues around people and as, as, as Andy said himself, you know, musicians, for example, uh, people being able to uh, move about and it isn't just whether their qualifications are recognised in other other countries, but also um, their ability to access those visas, as was pointed out. Um, and, you know, just the need to have a passport and understanding that those additional bureaucracy that we're seeing now impacting on the on the on the transport of goods hasn't even started on people um, and and there'll be a big piece of work to better understand what that means um, for us all. Um, in terms of um, businesses being advised to um, have um, have locations elsewhere. Um, I don't have a specific example of that today to give you. Um, uh, so um, uh, I think for me, like I said, I think it's still really early days because it's been incredibly difficult. And I think it's difficult for the businesses themselves to understand where um, COVID's 
finishes and, and, and this new working arrangement with the EU starts and what that actually means. It's not as it's not as clear cut as 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 that. So I think it is absolutely something we need to continue to monitor going forward. And 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 oh, I continue to meet with um all kinds of businesses and, and the organisations that represent them. Um, and so I'm 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 sure that that will get fed back and the work of the, the Growth Hub is doing on collecting that data and ensuring that they're continuing that survey um, is going to be really valuable. So I think this economic dashboard that we see um, is something that we absolutely need to continue to see on a regular basis so that we can truly understand what what is going on. I think if we were to try and think of maybe where there may be a positive we may see the opposite as well we may see um businesses concentrating on domestic markets or um onshoring um where they've maybe not done that before so um again something for us to watch and and, and we'll absolutely will do so and um, thank you thanks very much elise um Yes, absolutely right. You know, it's going to be a changing picture, but you've uh, set out all the issues really clearly for us this morning. So thank you very much indeed for that. Colleagues, let's move on to item 13, Greater Manchester Transport Strategy 2040 and the accompanying five year delivery uh, plan and local implementation plans that uh, go with it. Um, I'm um, Councillor Brett has had a good week uh, with the way Burnley are are performing. I'm going to cheer him up even more and say I'm not going to take you through the 633 pages of this uh, 2040 uh, strategy. Uh, I will just say a word, if I may, though, particularly about the five year uh, plan, because that's the most relevant thing to the people of Greater Manchester. That is all about starting to put in place the, the planks of our network, a London style public transport system for Greater Manchester. What I mean by that is integrated, affordable, with a cap on what people spend, making public transport a much better alternative to the car. And it's about bringing buses and our Metrolink system together in time, seeing a devolved rail system, uh, improving accessibility of our train stations so all of our citizens can, can use them, uh, making public transport uh, zero carbon so that it meets our our climate objectives. We need to see uh, a huge transformation, in my view, in public transport in Greater Manchester. Uh, that would be the most meaningful way in which the government could level up our region. It talks a lot about that, but hasn't defined what levelling up means. Well, I will say when a bus ticket in Greater Manchester costs the same as it does in London, then they'll have begun to level up this, this country. And of course, we are a, a long way from that at the moment. But this plan has been long in development. I want to thank colleagues at TFGM for the work that they've uh, put into it. The 2040 plan is comprehensive, it's up to date, uh, and I think it is a great route map for our city region. But also we've got the urgency in the five year plan and the specific steps that we will be going to taking uh, in the next few years to support it, starting with bus reform. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we need to make preparations so that whatever we decide, we can start to see the improvement in our buses and see it quickly. Uh, so all of this uh, lays the foundations for that. So colleagues, what we're asking you today is to approve uh, for adoption and publication the revised 2040 uh, transport strategy and also the um, the five year uh, delivery uh, delivery plan as a statement of how we're going to deliver our network, the London style public transport system for Greater Manchester. So I'm now going to throw the floor open uh, to you all. Uh, I don't know if anybody would like to come in on this item. I can see Councillor Councillor Brett. Uh, so over to you, Alan. Uh, yes, uh, as usual, I'll be brief. Uh, I welcome this visionary document. It's wide ranging and I fully support it, of course. Um, I want to uh, say that as a former member of the PTA, Passenger Transport Authority, all those years ago, um, I think TFGM's continued the good work. And just to show that I've read all the uh, uh, pages, I want you to refer you to uh, page 163, map three, <laughs> OK, um, where uh, Oldham uh, are also joining with Rochdale in the push for the extension of the Metrolink line from uh, the Bury uh, line towards uh, Middleton and then on to Oldham. Uh, I fully support this. I fully support everything else. And I'd also like to speak again 
on item 15. There you are, short, succinct, and just put it in your manifesto. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Alan. Yeah, uh, instructions uh, uh, taken. Um, Councillor Sean Fielding. Thanks, Chair. And uh, in following on from Councillor Brett, because the uh, proposal that I most welcome in this document is something that is very much linked to uh, a Metrolink line that Councillor Brett has championed, and that's the Metrolink line to Middleton that will be a spur off the Berry line. Now, what I've always been keen to see is high frequency connections between the northern towns of Greater Manchester, which exist in some part in the form of bus services at the moment. But really, if the Metrolink is coming as far as Middleton, then it doesn't have to be extended much further to join up with the Oldham line. And that will mean that residents of Oldham and Rochdale and Shaw and Metrolink users in those areas will be able to connect to Middleton and, and onto the Berry line without having to travel in and out of Manchester in the way that they do. It will also mean that the route can be designed in such a way that it will connect some of our parts of Chatterton that don't have the luxury of high frequency bus services at the moment. And it will go some way to really rebalancing the economy by improving the transport infrastructure in the north of Greater Manchester. So I very much welcome the inclusion of the connection from Middleton up to Oldham when that Metrolink line extension goes into Middleton as Councillor Brent has long campaigned for. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, thanks very much indeed, uh, Sean. Uh, Councillor Elise Wilson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, really echo what's been said. I think this shows um, a vision for what we're trying to achieve in Greater Manchester, and it's certainly something about um, a, an essential part of how how we're going to see not only the economic growth that we need going forward, but tackling a raft of um, um, of, of challenges that we, you know, big challenges that we're seeking to address um, and whether that's improved air quality, whether that's the environment, whether that's um, tackling um, and ensuring that um, we have active lifestyles. Um, the, 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 one, the one network that you uh, articulated so well at the beginning is it is about all of that. It's about sustainability going forward and that connectivity. Um, we know in Stockport that, um, again, champion some of the, 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 the that work that, that we're really pushing for to ensure that we remain um, one of the most connected boroughs in the north. And I think um, it doesn't just underpin that, that connectivity just doesn't underpin people being able to move about. It underpins the wider ambitions, for example, in Stockport's Mayoral Development Corporation and the work that we're really trying to achieve to see Stockport's uh, newest, coolest, greenest neighbourhood um, really come alive and flourish. Um, and the new interchange that's been there, which we'll see hopefully um, the Metrolink extension into Stockport um, in the not too distant future, along with further improvements around um, Stockport train station, as well as what that means and how that impacts on the whole of our borough um, and how we plug in the whole of Stockport into the wider Greater Manchester family. So um, I'm really pleased to see this piece of work um, and um, I don't think we can underestimate the impact that it's going to have on if, it, you know, if it is to come into fruition uh, on all of our lives. Um, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Elise, and, and thanks uh, to all colleagues for those uh, those positive uh, comments on, on the plan. I just would refer people to a comment from Paul Dennett in the chat. I think Paul's got to leave us uh, at this point, referencing um, a later item on uh, Swinton train station and the funding that we're finding to improve accessibility there after it was previously turned down by the government uh, for, for such funding. So um, we'll come on to that. But thank you, Paul, and very much. Um, it matters that it's uh, appreciated that the, um, uh, the the changes are going to go ahead. So, so thank you for putting that in, in the chat. Just to respond to, to you all, I you know I agree absolutely that we need to see Metrolink expand uh, in the south uh, and particularly in in the north, where we have our ambitions for the economic regeneration of the north of the conurbation, particularly around the northern gateway, and of course the Metrolink. Proposal that um, Alan and, and Sean have, have touched on is very much uh, part of part of that. I can assure you both that you may know this, but I'll remind you. I my first job was on the Middleton Guardian, um, and I have a great deal of affection uh, for the place. Uh, and like both of you, would love to see 
uh, Metrolink come to, to Middleton and would want to make a, a firm commitment. Alan, in my manifesto, will be on to see if we can make this a reality as soon as as soon as we possibly can. The vision here, just to re remind people, is obviously expanding Metrolink and then beginning to bring in those orbital links that Sean was referencing, be they by connecting Metrolink or tram train or more likely from a reformed bus system. So we, we have orbital uh, bus routes that then connect with Metrolink, but then single ticketing through it all as people have in London, uh, which will enable a much better, more affordable public transport system. And uh, I just would like to assure Elise in terms of the principles that underpin all of this um, and underpin our network, five principles, reliability uh, across public transport, affordability, accessibility for everybody, sustainability in terms of a climate and critically accountability. Our public transport is not currently sufficiently accountable to the public of Greater Manchester and if we bring it into a single whole then I believe we will have that accountability to the public as well. So thank you colleagues for your your comments. Um, I am going to put it now that you um, have considered and are minded to um, approve um, the um, uh, the uh, and uh, publish the revised GM transport strategy and five year uh, delivery uh, delivery plan. Colleagues, is that approved? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and now I will move on to item 14, Greater Manchester Clean Air Plan, consultation and, and related developments and hand over to Councillor Andrew Weston. Andrew. Thanks, Andy. I'll be fairly brief with this. Um, it is, in effect, largely just a paper that sets out future governance arrangements for when the um, clean air zone is introduced. And I draw members of attention in that regard, in particular, to the proposal at Recommendation 8 to um, establish a clean air charging authorities committee, um, which is a committee of the 10 local authorities, but also an air quality administration committee. Um, which would also include, in addition to the 10 boroughs, the GMCA. Um, the reasons for um, the establishment of these committees are as set out at paragraph 8.5 um, and the terms of reference are um, in appendix 6. Just to advise that um, I, as the um, portfolio holder for um, the clean air plan, would take the GMCA place um, on that Air Quality Administration Committee with Councillor Oliver Ryan from Tameside as my um, appointed deputy becoming my deputy on that committee also. Um, just a couple of broader points on this because I think it's important and in the public interest just to say so. Firstly, um, with regard to the long-standing issue that we have um, in Mottram in Tameside, just to say that we continue to be in um, increased increasingly positive, seemingly dialogue with ministers on um, this particular issue. We are keen to ensure that before any clean air zone is implemented, we have that resolution and we have made it extremely clear to ministers that we need to see that before the zone is um, impl implemented um, next year. But obviously, um, as the report says, there is currently um, an assessment being undertaken of what would be required in terms of um, an engineering or the solution to that. So um, welcoming the progress there. Members will be particularly interested as well to note that we have started distributing the bus retrofit funding um, since uh, December when we began that work. The take up is, is underway now. So that's incredibly important for the cleaning up of, of that fleet. Um, but I do just want, Andy, with your permission to say something more generally about where we are at with this clean air zone and clean air, uh, clean air plan, because obviously it is a um, substantial change in terms of the way that we have operated before across Greater Manchester, and it does impact on um, those with older fleet um, and commercial in the commercial setting. But I am increasingly concerned, and it's regrettable that I need to raise this on this call, by the antics of some local conservative politicians, um, certain members of parliament and in particular um, the mayoral candidate for Greater Manchester who appear to be labelling this a congestion tax 
and it's very very important when we are talking about cleaning up our air that we have truth and honesty in this debate we have to remember that this is government policy and it is one of the few pieces of tory policy that i wholeheartedly embrace and i think it's absolutely shameful to see a campaign being launched on these just false facts and the fake news that is being peddled and to that regard i wish to say publicly on the record to anybody who has been complicit in sharing that information deliberately to mislead to attack and to smear that the member of parliament for bolton northeast mark logan raised this matter in parliament on the 27th of november and one of the ministers responsible rebecca powell made it very clear what the position of the conservative government is on this matter when she assured him that only the most polluting vehicles and i'm quoting here are charged in a clean air zone and it is not a congestion charge the greater manchester plan does not include charging private vehicles and the evidence provided by manchester authorities to date shows that this is not needed and i just delicately remind all conservative politicians in greater manchester and anybody else who continues for political gain to be peddling this untruth that the last person who made their name for themselves in politics through the use of fake news was unceremoniously dumped from office this month thank you very much andy thank thank you uh, andrew um well, that couldn't have been uh, couldn't have been clearer and uh, and needed and needed saying we can't have a situation where we have a conservative government that uh, has policy positions that are kind of misrepresented at local level for for political uh, political purposes. That's what we've seen here, and I think the Greater Manchester public deserve better than that. So thank you for setting the record straight, uh, Andrew. Uh, could I invite uh, Councillor Brenda Warrington to contribute, Brenda? Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Burnham. I, I will be brief, but I, I really do want to put on uh, record uh, my appreciation and the appreciation of Tameside residents in Mottram um, for the support that we have received um, from particularly from um, Councillor Andy Weston uh, in Trafford in leading this particular piece of work, uh, because it, it, it is absolutely essential that we can all expect to hopefully benefit you know from this clean air plan and that we don't have any of our residents that are quite deliberately sort of left out of it by means simply uh, of a boundary issue uh, so just to put on my, my thanks on record thank you thank you uh, brenda um important to um important to, to do that so uh, colleagues could i i can't see anybody else uh, indicating a wish to contribute so could i just uh, turn uh, your attention to uh, the recommendations uh, i don't believe andrew wants to come back in again or on I the that's, that's fine. issue Th thank you andrew so nice. it's just it's to note uh, the progress uh, colleagues and um, the, uh, the the steps that are outlined in the um, uh, in the in the paper. Um, obviously, this is an ongoing uh, situation, and we'll continue to um, uh, to bring back develop the proposals with you carefully, uh, informing the public. Um, and yet, yeah, there is progress being made, and I think it is clear that um, whatever happens uh, with regard to uh, recovery from the pandemic, we are going to see the return of polluted air in Greater Manchester. I think it's pretty clear that that is what's going to happen, and hence we need to continue to um, accept the government's instruction uh, to introduce a clean air zone consistent with the government's policy, as, as Andrew so uh, eloquently set out. So, colleagues, can I ask that the uh, proposals are noted? Chair, Thank you. Uh, very much. Apologies, Jake. I'll just point out there is a specific recommendation, not just a note, but to a point. Um, a recommendation nine. Just make sure that people. Ah, can my apologies, that. Eamon. Thank, thank you for pulling me up on that. Uh, that's to appoint um, the portfolio holder with responsibility for clean air. Um, and that's obviously Andrew as the GMCA representative on the Air Quality Administration uh, Committee. Um, and uh, the assistant portfolio with responsibility for the plan as the substitute uh, member. I'm sure it's a role uh, Andrew is uh, eager to take up. So colleagues, do I have your approval uh, for that? 
Thank you very much, everybody. Um, item 15, prioritisation of the second tranche of transforming uh, cities uh, funding. You will recall uh, going back to 2017, we were allocated £240 million pounds in the uh, first tranche of transforming cities, and that has very largely, almost exclusively been devoted to the development of the B network, and we're going to come on to that in the final item, but also the purchase of new trams, and colleagues will know that they are slowly uh, but surely now being being delivered and uh, coming into our into our possession. So good progress being made at there, certainly on cycling and walking. This is a smaller allocation that was given to us of 69 million pounds uh, to support uh, other uh, emerging priorities. And what we have here uh, is the, um, uh, the proposed prioritisation uh, of that uh, funding, delivering a range of measures across uh, Greater Manchester. We've already uh, made mention of the um, funding to improve um, uh, disability access at uh, Swinton uh, Rail Station. Um, there are other uh, improvements uh, proposed, funding set aside potentially for new uh, Metrolink uh, uh, stops. Uh, on the rail side, the most uh, substantial item here is um, uh, an allocation to support a new station at Goldbourne. And colleagues, I need to just remind you that there is a long history to this. Um, the Wigan Borough has long campaigned for a new rail station in this area. The west of Greater Manchester in this, in this uh, area is very poorly served by uh, transport connections, but particularly uh, rail connections going back to the uh, to the beaching cuts of, of many years ago. Um, coming from the west, there is a, a stop at Newton Lee Willows, uh, but then nothing uh, in this part of Greater Manchester all the way until Patricroft. Um, and obviously this has left a, a significant gap uh, for many, many years. So the proposal is made for a, a rail station at Goldbourne have to say there are timetable changes that that in some ways could threaten the existing service that runs through this line um, which would be crucial to the delivery of this new station and I need to put on the record today that we will be making extremely strong representations together with the leader of uh, the Wigan Borough Council that this service from Cumbria through uh, Goldbourne uh, to Manchester Airport is maintained in the timetable uh, to open up access to the rail network for for residents in the um, the east of the Wigan Borough, uh, Goldbourne, Lowton, Lee, uh, a wide area that will be served by this this new uh, this new station. There are other proposals uh, here, colleagues. Quality bus uh, corridor measures to support our bus reform um, ambitions. Um, there is funding set aside here, £10 million to support the development of a, uh, the electric vehicle charging network, which we have previously considered as matching funding to bring in more funding from the government. So th there's a, a range of proposals uh, here. Uh, they're all set out uh, in the report. Um, and obviously what I'm seeking today is your approval of this prioritisation uh, and um, that the programme is governed by the single pot assurance framework uh, and as such, the existing growth deal governance procedures are used for development and approval and that the, um, the TCF2 programme is included in the Transport Capital Plan. Uh, can I invite Councillor Keith Cunliffe to speak? Thanks, Andy. Uh, can I just say from Wigan's point of view, we absolutely support some of the recommendations within this report that impact on the borough. Uh, you've mentioned the uh, the funding for a new station in Goldburn and that is as you say a very long uh, fight to try and get a station in Goldburn and you'll remember that from a previous position that you held some years ago um, and, and really I'd like to pay tribute to the consistency the determination and the tenacity of the Goldburn councillors of Councillor Yvonne Cleave Councillor Susan Gambles and Councillor Gina Merritt in continually pushing uh, for this new station in Goldburn. Um, so, so I do welcome that. Uh, I think it'd be a significant uh, improvement and one of the reasons why it's identified as the best performing one was clearly the, um, the minimal risk to journey time uh, from existing rail users 
and the potential to generate new demand, but it is dependent on, like you said, that uh, that Cumbria to Manchester Airport uh, service uh, being available through Goldburn. Um, certainly the council will need to engage fully with TFGM on this uh, proposal and to move it forward. One, to maximise the benefits to the local community and ensure it's integrated effectively, uh, but also to ensure that any adverse implications that there may be are mitigated as far as possible. So that will require some resourcing and possibly a financial contribution to that scheme. Um, there is the work today has not considered uh, the governance structure of delivering a new rail station there, and, and certainly Wigan Council will, will be working with TFGM to determine an appropriate governance structure. Uh, as the project progresses to outline business case stage. Uh, and we need to understand really if the proposed funding allocation can progress that outline business uh, case uh, stage immediately. Uh, so fantastic opportunities. It's been a long, long time coming, but actually we're actually getting a bit nearer. The other proposal that's recommended within the report is the proposal for the uh, two million pound travel hub park and ride on the guided busway at Tilsley. That will be a fantastic opportunity for Tilsley and will manage to mitigate some of the difficulties that have resulted in car parking within Tilsley Town Centre. And certainly we'll be working with TFGM and Tilsley Traders Association to help accelerate the uh, delivery of that new travel hub and that park and ride facility. We all know the guided busway from Lee into Manchester has been a huge success. Um, probably we're victims of our own success really that that has created problems in uh, particularly in Tilsley here. So this park and ride, this hub and this park and ride facility will be a significant improvement and help both the traders in Tilsley, but also help people using the busway. So, so we fully support the recommendations that are put in this report. Thanks, Andy. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, I've got um, Councillor Sean Fielding and then Councillor Alan Brett. So Sean first, John. Uh, thank you, Chair. And this is a point that's related to my earlier comments about a circular route on the Metrolink, which would involve the connection of Me uh, the Middleton extension up to Alden, providing that uh, northern circular. I know it was previously an ambition of a, a leader of the council that came before me to have a similar connection via Metrolink from Oldham down to Ashton, um, but for uh, reasons including the huge valley that um, to, separates Oldham from Ashton. That is something that is incredibly uh, difficult and expensive to implement. But what I have seen in this report, which is very welcome, is the investment of the Transforming Cities funding in taking forward some of the work around quality bus transit, uh, specifically on the Rochdale Oldham Ashton corridor. So there's already a high frequency bus connection connecting Ashton to Oldham and then on to, to Rochdale. Um, but the infrastructure improvements, which will bring it up to the kind of standard that Councillor Cunnerliffe has talked about on the uh, guided busway out towards Lee, would be very much welcome and contribute towards our investment in Oldham Town Centre and the public realm works that are going on there uh, with other uh, parts of GM funding that have come forward for that and of course our own funding, but also the improvements that we could see in Royton Town Centre which of course is a town centre challenge uh, town in Greater Manchester, which was designated uh, a couple of years ago. And so that will see further improvements in connectivity for Royton, improvements in public realm and improvements in the transport infrastructure, which will really complement our ambitions for Royton, which demonstrates that as a council, we do have ambitions beyond the centre of Oldham and our ambitions for all parts of our borough. Thanks, Chair. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Sean. And you make the really important point that this package is uh, contributory to the vision that we were just um, just discussing a couple of items ago. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Councillor Brett. Can I support everything that uh, Councillor Fielding has said and hope we can get some money? Can I also support you in Goldburn? I'm so old, I was a GMC councillor and I can't even remember the name now of the 
and the councillors, but he used to regularly stand up and tell me that Lee was the largest town in England that didn't have a railway station. So that's how long you've been campaigning for this. Can I also come to another one on there? The electric charging network. If we're doing what I call joined up policy, clean air, uh, congestion, all the other things that we've got, all linked together policies, surely the electronic charging network is vital. It's also the question I keep being told, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? The old question. So do you put in all the charging network in advance of the cars or do you wait until the demand from the cars come? I'm one of those that think you've got to get the network in and once you've got the network, people will then know that their cars can be charged. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you, Alan. Uh, I agree with you. I think there's a bit of a sort of a, um, a kind of a chicken and egg situation, as you say here, because you know people are waiting for each other to move. And I think the important thing with the electric vehicle charging is that the public sector moves using the funding that we've got to, to kickstart the whole the whole process. And I think that's what's being proposed uh, here with the ten million pounds set aside, and then the market hopefully will follow in in time. So you're right. We need to we need to get get the thing get the thing moving, particularly with the clean air agenda that Andrew just just set out before. Can I um, thank Keith for uh, just mentioning Tilsley uh, and the proposed uh, improvements there? Because uh, in many ways what's happened in Tilsley with the pressure on parking and some of the challenges the residents and the business have faced is is because of the success of the Lee Guided Busway and that's in itself a tribute to the work of uh, TFGM who persuaded me as the former MP that it was the right thing to do and it has turned out to be the right thing given the success but we need to manage the success of the Lee Guided Busway and I think the uh, investment for Tilsley will help us do that but I just finished by picking up on all of the, the comments colleagues have made about uh, about Goldbourne and uh, Keith absolutely right to praise the current uh, three ward uh, councillors Yvonne Cleave, Susan uh, Gambles and Gina, Gina Merritt for the, their tenacity absolutely being being the word but Alan, uh, I think you were referring to um, uh, uh, Councillor Tom Sherratt, I, I believe, uh, who, who made the case for this station many, many uh, years ago, very forcefully, as did Brian Simpson MEP. It does have a long history and it was actually in the package that was uh, presented as part of the debate about, about a real congestion charge for Greater Manchester um, some 10 years ago. Um, and. Uh, it's never been brought to fruition. So the, the people in Goulburn and Lowton have had their hopes raised a number of times. Um, I think we all need to be determined that that doesn't happen uh, falsely raised. We need to make sure that this is now uh, delivered. Um, and um, I also think it is very important to point out because there are aspirations for new stations across Greater Manchester. As Councillor Cunliffe said, this one came out at the very top uh, of the list when it comes to deliverability of new stations. So this is the uh, independently assessed uh, most uh, deliverable station in, in Greater Manchester uh, as long as we keep that service, which we will be making representations to the rail industry to do. So colleagues, thanks for your comments on uh, this item, uh, an important item. Uh, and can I, I have uh, brought to your attention the recommendations? Can I ask for your support for them? Thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's move on to our final item, uh, Mayor's Walking and Challenge uh, Fund. Um, you're very familiar with the B Network and I don't need to take you through again. And this is a bit of a berry fest, I'm afraid, uh, this morning. So um, I can't sprinkle the good news around, I'm afraid. It's only heading in one direction uh, this morning. So I, I just feel duty bound to hand the floor straight to uh, Councillor O'Brien, if he would like to, uh, to, to speak. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and yes, of course, I'm uh, very uh, glad to see uh, Barry getting in, in on the action on this because it is an important agenda and it's really important actually for what I can say, one of the smaller boroughs who perhaps does not have the capacity to uh, always design some of these bigger schemes um, that we do get this type of funding. Um, it's really helpful um, to get us to a point where we can then be competitive in uh, you know, funding bids and putting money aside for walking and cycling schemes. Um, it really does help um, you know, lift our capacity to where our ambitions are. 
and I think that's exactly where we need to be and it's one of the benefits uh, certainly of working together across Greater Manchester is that you can access some of these resources and get some of this additional support you know through GMCA through TFGM uh, and and ultimately make these improvements um, this is uh, this has been a priority of mine over the last year uh, since becoming leader um, I established a new cabinet role looking specifically at transport and infrastructure to give this a real focus uh, on the basis that we would be more competitive and better able to win some of these funds and I'm glad to say uh, that uh, that has paid off. Um, we put some additional capacity as well into our uh, walking and cycling uh, officer team. We've been working together with public health as well, uh, which we know um, benefits massively from getting people out of the cars, uh, getting people out walking and cycling, but doing so safely. So we really hope that this money will unlock the potential we know is out there to get our residents in these four areas uh, more active, um, out and about, as I say, safely. Um, we've got a couple of other initiatives as well, which I think are going to be very beneficial looking at the way in which low traffic neighborhoods can be implemented as uh, new cycle uh, schemes as well so it's part of a package of things that in Barry we're really trying to push uh, and I know it's obviously something we're all committed to across Greater Manchester so of course it's great uh, and very welcome to see uh, Barry getting this money but I think it's also great to see that we're taking our commitment seriously to getting people uh, more active, um, getting them out walking and cycling, but in ways that are safe and uh, sustainable going forward. So very welcome uh, from Barry's perspective, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eamon. And uh, yes, it's great to be able to deliver this good news uh, for you this morning, as long as obviously, of course, the CA uh, supports, supports it, as I'm sure they will. Um, it's worth me just saying that obviously we've discussed this morning um, transforming cities round one and round two, uh, which together is about 300 million pounds. And this is devolved funding where we've decided how it should be spent. And I think we can say with some confidence that uh, we're using this funding better than perhaps if it had been decided in an office in Whitehall. We've decided that our communities need to have better access to walking and cycling. We know where the rail stations are that need support. We just, we're deciding to improve at Swinton when nationally that wasn't seen as a priority. Uh, I think this makes the case for devolved funding and I'm pleased that the government has committed to devolved intra-city transport funding uh, going forward because I think we're proving that we're using it and we're using it better. And a message I would give to the government is we all agree with levelling up, you know, we all want to see levelling up, but you can't level up top down. You can't decide everything from Whitehall and tell communities that you, they've been levelled up. We'll decide when we've been levelled up, but based on the ability to direct the funding to where it's most needed. And I think we've demonstrated that today. Lots of places traditionally neglected for support from central government have today benefited at this combined authority meeting. Goldbourne, Tilsley, Swinton, parts of Bury, And I think that's a really powerful story of how devolution is helping us reach the parts that central government, Whitehall government has traditionally not reached, has failed to reach. So really powerful, positive story, colleagues, to end uh, our meeting on today. So could I uh, ask that the recommendations as set out in the report be approved? Thank you very much. We just need to go on to item seven, which is the date of our next meeting, which is Friday the 12th of February. I take it that that is uh, acceptable to everybody and that concludes uh, the business for today. Uh, probably a record I think, um, not quite within the hour but uh, not far off uh, uh, Alan. Um, so on uh, an hour and 15 minutes of this combined authority meeting I'm going to thank you all for your excellent contributions this morning for your attendance to echo our best wishes to Jim uh, and wish him all the best for his retirement and at this point declare our meeting closed. Thank you very much indeed colleagues. Thank you, Chair. Have a good weekend. Bye. Thank you. Bye.